Hi guys, I'm Dan, this is Kai, and we are the directors at Crescent Mortgages. Today we're talking you through the top five mistakes that first time buyers make. We see these all the time, so we're gonna be talking you through the common mistakes and how to avoid them, and also make sure you stay tuned to the end because we are gonna be talking you through some really important tips of how to negotiate the best possible price for your new property. Let's jump into it. Before we jump into it, just to remind you that we are mortgage brokers, mm. not YouTubers. So if you need any assistance with anything as part of the process, if you want us to assist you with your mortgage application or have an initial kind of conversation with you to, to work out what's achievable, you can contact us through the website, give us a call, send us an email or leave something in the comments and we'll do our best to come back to you. Now, today we're going to be talking through the issues that first time buyers have and I mm. guess it's understandable that first time buyers would make a mistake because it's in the title, it's the first time you're doing it and that the mortgage and house buying process is not straightforward. Mm. There's a lot to think about. We have made other videos with more information about the process, but today is the, the top five mistakes that we see, mm. which, which could cause real problems if you are hoping to buy a property either now or in the future. So I guess, should we just talk them through one by one? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, let's do it, yeah. yeah. You're gonna start or shall I? I'll start if you want. Okay, yeah, yeah. number one. Uh, not speaking to a mortgage professional, funnily enough, as we've just mentioned, we are. Uh, most, of course, we'd like you to speak to us. Speaking to a mortgage professional is, is important. That person is there, <clears throat> they've done it hundreds, maybe thousands of times, and are there to make sure you don't make the mistakes. Some of the mistakes we're gonna go through now, really. Yeah, yeah. I get, it's with respect, we do see a lot of people that mm. have spoken to their mate down the pub, who's told them, oh yeah, you can do this, you can do that, and, and they take it as gospel. Just because maybe you respect them in some fields doesn't mean that they're in a position to give you mortgage advice. So if you make assumptions about what is gonna be achievable or how much you can borrow or what your mortgage payments are gonna be, you could find actually you're very, very disappointed when it comes to it. So always start by speaking to a mortgage professional. We can obviously check affordability, mm -hmm. so how much you can borrow, which varies drastically from lender to lender, person to person. Um, we can give you an indication of what kind of deposit you're gonna need. Um, really importantly, give you an idea of what kind of mortgage payments to expect. Yeah. Um, people go in without any idea what the mortgage payment is gonna be. So you've got absolutely no idea if it's gonna be affordable to you when you also factor in your, you know, your other bills, your council tax, your insurances, your utilities, that kind of stuff. Mm. So always speak to a mortgage broker yeah. before you start the process or get your hopes up on any properties. That should be yeah. the very first thing that you should do. Yeah. I guess that leads us on to does. point number two, doesn't yeah, it? it? Which does. is? Which is obtaining an agreement in principle. Or a mortgage in principle, or a decision in principle, they're all called different things. The it's, same the thing. same thing, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's the same yeah. thing. And what is it? Um, it's, <laughs> it's an agreement <laughs> in principle. It's, it's, um, it's essentially that a lender has checked, or, or broker possibly has checked, and confirms you can get a mortgage based on your circumstances. Um, so they will have gone through your income, your deposit, other fat, your expenditures, touched on your credit, um, and based off that conversation, will know that you can get a mortgage and up to what sort of value you can get a mortgage. Yeah. So the agreement in principle, decision in principle, whatever you want to call it, is essentially a certificate to mm. confirm that you've checked with a bank or a broker that you, you should be able to get a mortgage, but it's not a guarantee. Every, it will be subject to an assessment, yeah. but that is the certificate that you will normally need to show to an estate agent when you go to view and potentially make an offer on a property. That's, that gives them the peace of mind that you've done your due diligence and you've checked that you should be able to get a mortgage. They know it's not a guarantee, but if you just rock up and you've not looked into mortgages at all, you don't have that certificate, they're probably gonna turn you away or maybe not let you at least make an offer yeah. until they've, they've, they've kind of run the checks to make sure that you've done that. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes they involve a credit check and sometimes they don't. Um, you know, a broker may not do a credit check and there isn't necessarily a need to. If you go to your bank directly, they will do a credit check on you to get an agreement in principle. Um, we don't necessarily advise that if, if no. you don't have any concerns over your credit, but no. if you do obviously run that past your broker and they can obviously let you know what they need to check. On to number three. Hmm. This is a really important one. Yeah, that's a little important. Yeah, they are really important. But, but okay, this, this is one. This is quite a big one. Yeah, it's common, yeah, really I do common. Hear a lot, this one. 
just going to your own bank mm. to obtain a mortgage. So I guess a couple of facets to this. Number one, there are a very large amount of lenders in the UK. Mm. Many high street lenders and then some specialists, some smaller building societies who mm. sometimes have good interest rates. If you, let's say there's 50 lenders out there and you go to just one bank, your own bank, who occasionally can, but normally won't give preferential rates. Almost never these days. Yeah, you, you get the odd one, but happen, on the but whole, you'll get exactly happen. the same rates regardless of who you bank with. Mm -hmm. So if you're going, if there's 50 lenders out there and you're just going to one and you're just sticking with that one throughout the whole process, then there's a what 2% chance that you've found the best lender and the best rate and the best criteria for you. So yes, you know, people like the idea of sticking with their own bank and you know, you might be familiar with the, the company and the brand and you have a good experience, but generally the mortgage and the banking platforms are separate. Mm. And the other point mm. I guess is that if you go to your own bank, they still need to carry out the same checks. Yeah. We hear it all the time, don't they, where people say, well actually I already bank with them, can they not just check on the system? Yeah. No, they, no. They, they need to run the, the checks regardless, don't yeah. they? Yeah, generally the, the only benefit I would say you consistently get with your own lender is that they will obviously know you to a degree so they might, well, they might have seen your ID already or, or, or your address proof at some point, but so many banks or lenders, new lenders do that electronically these days that they don't need to see it either. Yeah. That's the only thing that I would say sometimes is better with your bank and that's such a minimal point for what might cost you thousands of pounds for not just checking somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. If your if your lender doesn't have the yeah. absolute best rate on the market, you can, and again, remember this isn't a small this isn't a small loan or a small mm. kind of you know financial agreement. This is a huge debt. So a mm. slight d difference in the interest rate could actually make thousands of pounds of difference across the initial scheme. So on the whole, there's little or no benefit to just going with your own bank. Now, obviously, we do encourage you always to speak to a broker. They can shop around and they have the tools that you just don't have if you mm. go online. Now, if you tell your broker that you do have a preference to your own bank, they can obviously factor that in when they do the research. And actually, if your own bank does look like they might be appropriate and they do have competitive rates, then obviously they can always take that on board. But just focusing on that one bank and not shopping around across the market is a big no-no. Yeah, I think, I think the only other point I've got on going to your bank directly or building society directly is if things go wrong, they don't have a plan B. They can't. You know, if, if that lender says no, you can't then say, you're back to, how, you're how back about to the yes. start, aren't you? You're <laughs> yeah. back to the start. That's it, yeah, you are, you, your plan B is go online again and look, look elsewhere, decline. or yeah. if you bank with someone else, go to the, you, you, you're back to square one and yeah. have to start again. Whereas with a, with a broker, if you get declined, before they've even called you, they mm. probably check to see, right, okay, what's the next option? Mm. And we'll mm. give you a call and let you know if, if you know that we can try the next best option available in the market, mm. um, rather than again, you having to start from scratch. So yeah. yeah, that is a big one. Four, slight deviation, but really, really yeah. important. We, you know, we know that yeah. a lot of people don't want to talk about this because they're, you know, all they're concentrating on is getting the, the, the house, yep. but it's not taking your insurances, especially your life insurances mm. seriously enough. So often, but not always, first time buyers can be a bit younger in the scheme of things. You might mm. be in your twenties, you might be in your thirties, maybe forties. I mean, there's obviously no limit, but that's generally kind of a, a bit more of what we see. So if you are young, if you are healthy, maybe you don't feel that actually you need to take out a life insurance that's gonna cover mm. you if you pass away because you feel that you know, you're, you're, you're safe and you're healthy and nothing's gonna happen to you. Actually, that's the exact time when you should take out a cover because mm. that's when you can get cover and it's cheaper. If you wait 10 years and you've had health issues as you're older, you might not be able to get cover and you're gonna be um, finding that it's much more expensive. And I guess aside from that, taking out a mortgage is when you should be looking to kind of take that seriously and, and, and protect yourself, if you, especially if you don't have anything already. Yeah, yeah no, exactly that, exactly that. As, as, as Darren said, length of time you get a mortgage for and the fact that getting insurance when you're young and healthy is easier, cheaper. The, the, there's so many reasons why you should do it earlier and they often will be a little bit tailored to you and again that's important it's just making sure you're having the conversation properly it's probably all that yeah. all that i would tell people to do it doesn't mean you have to have it or you should but there's normally a reason you should having the conversation specifically generally again with your broker or if needs be your bank and having an honest conversation about it where you genuinely listen and take it on board yeah that, that's all you can do yeah i mean ultimately 
buying a house, taking out a mortgage, it's a big grown up thing to do and you need to make sure you make sensible choices alongside that. And one of those is obviously making sure that you are protected so you and the people that you love are able to maintain mortgage bills, whatever, if mm. you become ill or pass away. And obviously mm. your broker will be able to give you advice on, on what's available to tailor something to your budget. So the final point before we jump over to some advice to and tips to, to negotiate the best price on the property. So point number five, mm. I guess underestimating your deposit and fees requirements, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. ultimately it's not, you know, you are going to have to pay money up front to purchase a property and you need mm. to make sure you've calculated and have access to that money when it's going to be required towards the end of the, the application process before you get the keys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, 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 the deposit's the biggest one. That's that's so it's probably the one that you're most aware of. But but again, some people really aren't quite so sure. Yeah. Deposit, but then on top, legal fees, sometimes valuation or survey fees, if ever so slightly. Sometimes lenders have fees, although again, rarely. I don't want to get into the... the the specifics yeah. on fees, really, because yeah. they, they, they can vary. We've done a whole, we've done a couple of videos on that. Yeah, over and the years, stamp but, duty. To be fair, yeah. I mean, it varies throughout Britain, um, and the thresholds change. So we're not mm. going to get into the finer details because depending on when you're watching this video. But at the moment, there is an exemption for first-time yeah. buyers as long as you buy below a certain threshold. So yeah. you may not have to pay stamp duty, which is normally quite a big outlay. Mm. Um, but your deposit and your legal fees are generally the two biggest, aren't they? Yeah, yeah that's say uh, Legal fees could be about 2,000, give or take, depending on the property that you buy and the quality of the solicitor. Mm. And then the other one is, is your deposit, which back in point one, when you first speak to your broker, that will be ironed out. So if you yeah. let them know kind of roughly how much you have or how much you think you will have saved and the kind of property prices you're looking at, your broker will work out if that's gonna be enough mm. um, uh, to, to buy the property that you need. So make sure that that is ironed out beforehand and that mm. you don't forget the legal fees and find yourself a couple of grand short at the end of the process. And again, your broker can give you an idea of what that's gonna be at the start of the process. Mm. Bonus yeah, I guess. I guess that leads us on and these, these are really important. So if you're a first time buyer, um, obviously you're going to be viewing properties and you want to negotiate the best possible price. Now, the how the negotiations go will largely depend on the market. Of course, if you know, if there's loads of buyers all looking at one house, then or one flat, you're going to have less kind of room and leverage to be able to negotiate because actually they've got another 10 viewings booked and someone might make an offer straight away. But actually, if it's kind of a bit more the other way or, you know, there's not as many viewings, then there's certainly room to always try and negotiate the, the price. You know, the worst they can do is say no, as long as you obviously, you know, you're you're being kind of realistic. If you, you know, if you come in and offer them half the purchase price, then, you know, maybe they're not going to take you seriously. But if you can shave however many thousand off, then that's obviously a you know a great mm. thing to do. I guess a couple of tips then in terms of how to approach that. Mm. I think for, for me, my, my, my first one is that anyone selling a house or a property, um, both the person selling and, and the um, estate agent that's often selling it, they all want speed and ease. Almost yeah. all of them do. You're a first time buyer. Generally, you know, you're not having any chain. You may have rental commitments, but are, are relatively flexible. Um, the fact that you can move quite quickly, quite flexibly, don't have to wait for another property to be sold, is, is always a good selling point. If you are in Definitely. a good position, that's, people love to hear that. They like first time buyers, you become chain free, estate agents like it, and then they pass your offer on more positively, funnily enough. It significantly reduces the things that can go wrong. Mm. If you're trying to sell your house yeah. and the buyer's trying to sell their house and there's a chain, then all it takes is for one of those purchases to fall through and it can then have a knock-on effect on the property that you're buying. Yeah. So it makes the estate agents a bit nervous. Yeah. If you're a first-time buyer, you're not selling anything and you can just move whenever the, the process yeah. completes, it is, a big, it is a big selling point to them and the, the, um, the, se the seller. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah lost yeah, my. Yeah, yeah. Um, so make sure you say, look, we're a first time buyer. We've got agreement, an agreement in principle. We're ready to move as quickly as possible. That will always only be a, a positive. Yeah. Um, ask lots of questions to the estate agent. Ask as many yeah. questions as you want. View as many properties as you yeah. need. So you've got some comparisons. Again, depends on the market. But if you go on right move and you see there's five properties on there, all within the right area, all within a similar budget then go and view all of them. So you've mm. got comparisons. Mm. Um, that's a big mistake that people just fall in love with the first yeah. one they see and they've got nothing to compare it to. And onto the questions, ask the estate agent 
if there's room for movement. Ask them if the seller will go below the asking price. The worst they can do is say no, but a lot of the time the estate agent wants to sell. Yeah. So if they know that they're gonna to have to drop the price slightly to sell, then you know they might tell you. Again, they are working for the seller, but you know they can often give you clues as to what the seller will be willing to go down to. Um, and the other big one is if often on the estate agent's website or on Rightmove, if you're searching online, it, will, it should tell you when the property was first listed and if it's been reduced. So if the property has been on the market for three, four weeks or longer, it means that they're not actually having a huge amount of interest on that property within the kind of the prices that they're hoping for. And there could be some, some room for you to renegotiate. And again, if the price has been reduced, it means that they're not getting a huge amount of attention. They've had to reduce the price and maybe there could be some more room for negotiations there. Yeah. Any anything that we've missed? I mean, again, we've just touched on that quite quickly, but we did want to just give a, a little bit of valuable information on your negotiation, because that will be around the corner for you if you are a first time buyer. Um, but as always, if you have specific questions, you can you can give us a call. Um, we'll obviously run through the initial consultation with you. It's all free throughout the whole process um, to work out kind of what you can borrow, send you the agreement in principle and get you on your way. So give us a call, head over to the website, leave something in the comments, or you can drop us an email and we'll come back to you as soon as we can. Talk soon.